we think that this will promise to be a very thought-provoking and interesting discussion on artificial intelligence and how it can be moved from theory to practice within your enterprise. My name is Aaron Seaton. I'm the CEO of Tau Solutions, and we're a financial technology company that develops and markets solutions for the global structured finance industry. I wanted to say thank you to the SFA, specifically for putting on this important topic on the agenda, and I'm pleased this morning to have the opportunity to moderate this session for you. With me, I have a distinguished panel of subject matter experts who will take us through the basics of AI and provide us some practical examples, which is most important, of how it's being used today in the context of structured finance and as well the broader uh, financial services marketplace. Without further ado, I will let the panel introduce themselves, starting with, is it Damien on the? Yes, hi. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks again. I'd echo uh, what Aaron said and welcoming you all to uh, a Wednesday morning panel, and uh, thank you for attending. My name is Damien Weldon. I'm founder and president of Malabdenum. We're a consulting and advisory practice based in the Bay Area, focused on machine learning, AI, and applied category theory and applied to mortgage and real estate capital markets. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Johnson, founder and CEO of Vervent. Uh, Vervent, some of you may be more familiar with Vervent's predecessor companies, First Associates Loan Servicing and PFSC. Uh, Vervent is a um, provider of back office financial services, such as loan servicing, call center support, capital market support, and a number of other activities, which tend in general to be fairly boring, but critical to the functioning of the financial markets. Uh, we are heavy users of AI, uh, so you'll find most of the time when I talk about things today, it's like, you know, I talk about it like a hammer. I'm the guy who uses it, and I know what I can do with it. I'm not as much on how it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hal. I'm a, the co-founder and CTO of Vichara Technologies. Uh, we're a firm that focuses on trading and risk management for structured finance. Um, Certainly, we're looking and starting to apply AI in some of our applications, and we see a great deal of promise. So. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ashley Fiddler. I'm the Chief Product Officer of Eigen Technologies. We're a natural language processing platform, and we do a lot of work in the ABS space. Good morning. Uh, I'm a Senior Principal Scientist at FICO, responsible for research and innovation in the SCORES department. Uh, prior to joining FICO 23 years ago, I have been applying AI and machine learning in theory, so I studied that and uh, was a researcher in the field, uh, programmed my first deep learning, as it's called today, backpropagation neural networks 30 years ago. And then when I joined FICO, kind of, I got that pract practice shock, right, uh, how to apply the lab thing, the, the, the science in the field. So happy to be on the panel with you. Great, well, welcome everybody. So I think before we actually dive into dis discussing a little bit about the practicality and some examples of uh, how it's being applied today, one of the things that we wanted to begin with as a panel when we sat down to think about this, we thought about a lot of the misconceptions that exist within uh, people's thinking about what exactly is artificial intelligence. Uh, and it, you know, apart from what you see in Hollywood movies, it's actually very different. So we're not talking about uh, you know, data on Star Trek, and for, if I'm dating myself, then that's okay. Um, but we're not talking about a type of general AI. So we thought we, it would be a good idea to start with uh, giving the, uh, the audience an overview of different interpretations of what AI and how they're being used today. And so with that, we're going to start off with David, who's going to give us an introduction into how it, it, it's used in the context of his world. Excellent. Thank you. So. Um, first off, I think it's great that we have someone with the title scientist on our panel. That makes us legit. <laughs> you know, a very cool title. Um, at Vervent, uh, we have a little context. We have two major instances of AI that we use, one that handles documents and one that handles voice communication. Um, in the last roughly 18 months, we've won three hackathons for our AI algorithms in a few different um, contexts. So we're relatively savvy users of AI. Um, our AI that handles speech, we um, outsource the bulk of that. Uh, it's more of a SaaS model. The AI that handles documents, we built that in-house. It's kind of like our little, you know, kind of garage project. 
um, but they're both you know, very heavy. And we tend to think of AI as what it is, is in three different buckets. First is just basic robotic process automation, taking something a human can do and just doing it a whole lot faster and more accurately. Pretty straightforward. In the instance of the AI that handles documents for us, um, we have you know, kind of hundreds of millions of documents in custody. Um, it's something very simple, even like lifting the contents of a document off of it in a securitization format, comparing that to the loan list that's going into the securitization and making sure those things match. You know, very simple, just speeding things up and making them more accurate. Um, and the uh, ability to do that, when we first entered the market with this AI, and now I'm going to date myself because this was like six years ago, um, most of that work was being done by humans in the old technology, which was called stare and compare. And uh, it would generally take to do a securitization uh, roughly 15 to 20 days, business days, where sometimes even people would print out the documents, which, you know, I don't know why, but, and then look at those, verify them manually, and then voila, here's your loan list. Now we've reduced that to the point where we can handle a 30, 40,000 uh, loan securitization in the space of about five hours. And you know, of course the cost is plummeted along that. So that would be like a basic robotic process automation. And the second bucket would be cognitive insight. And this is just taking a mass of data and sifting through it and figuring out what it means, gaining insight out of that data. In our business, we have a large call center component. And so the biggest source of data in our entire business, as you can imagine, are those verbal interactions, right? And for any company that deals with consumers, those verbal interactions, I mean, that's a huge data stream and most people don't do anything with it. There's a lot of regulatory hair around that about what you have to do with it and things like that. But for us, we record, obviously, we record all of these calls that happen um, and then we run them all through our AI, which is not weaponized or anything, so it's not, you know, nothing good like that. Um, but it does do things like tell us what people are saying. So if we talk to 20,000 people in a day and we want to know in general, what are these people saying? The old methodology would be kind of go walk the call center floor and say, hey, what are people saying? Um, now we know what they're saying because we listen to every single call and it's nice. And a concrete example of what you can do with that kind of thing is if you have some legal language that you need to say in front of the call, for example, it's like, I know that we said that language in every single call. I know we missed a word when we were saying it. And it gives you a layer of security around compliance, which you just can't do any other way. Other issues like, you know, um, for consumers who are maybe they're not making their loan payments, why are they unable to make their loan payments? You can pull that out of that morass of data because they've said something about it. That's cognitive insight. And then cognitive engagement is the ability to talk to the machine and basically believe you're talking to a human. And this, to me, is like where we're not, right? The first two, we're absolutely there. We absolutely use those. On the third one, we're not there yet. At some point, you know, we would expect that we won't have any human agents at all, and it'll all be run on cognitive insight. So those are, at least to me, those are the three buckets of AI, and that's what it is. Thank you, David. And uh, now I'm going to call upon Gerald to provide a description of uh, his contextual view of, of AI and how it applies at FICO. Sure. Um, so uh, I think uh, my perspective will be very biased from a credit score development perspective. Um, it has been said that the FICO score is perhaps the most scrutinized model in the world and it's under regulation. So we need to be kind of extra careful in applying machine learning to the FICO score. Uh, but first of all, I want to give you kind of a history uh, timeline. and and the definition of AI. Um, so there are many definitions and I would start with what the scientists who originated the field were basically up to. It was a quest to understand how humans think and behave. Now from an engineering perspective, I think most of us are probably much closer to that. Uh, it's a quest to build intelligent machines that can perceive, so for example, like example the gentleman gave, uh, understanding uh, speech, and then uh, based on that, create some mapping to an action, and then also have a feedback loop, so they can observe the outcome of that action, 
what kind of result it created and then put that back into learning and next time taking the action improving. So kind of a, a self-improving system. Um, and then for, for, I think, most of you, in, from an investment perspective, it's monetizing data and also making processes more efficient. And then I would add uh, important uh, stakeholders, the regulators, the ethicists, they, they want to make sure that AI doesn't take over and we're not so much thinking about those robots who will kill us and run the world. I think that's, that would be the general intelligence we are very far from that. Uh, we are doing narrow AI right now in the form of machine learning. But there can be real dangers in terms of garbage in, garbage out. So if we feed them the wrong data, and sometimes garbage is very sub, you know, subtle. Uh, we could learn from a biased data set and then by automating what's been learned, we could uh, kind of amplify these biases and create what some people call weapons of mass like in mathematics, destruction. So we, we, we want to avoid these negative feedback loops. Um, so in terms of the timeline, AI, I, uh, the, the term artificial intelligence was coined in the 50s and initially it started with uh, writing computer programs that could do some basic logic and uh, learn some games, like simple games, rule-based like checkers and uh, do some mathematical proofs and uh, at that time also the first uh, early neural networks, the so-called perceptron was developed. And the timeline of the AI is, is kind of a, a, an up and down with, I would say, a general trend, certainly upwards, but there have been these AI winters and in the early days, uh, probably in the 70s, um, people came to a re realization that these promises of the early AI were over-exaggerated and there was kind of a hype uh, and then they figured out it doesn't scale, that the, the simple neural, neural nets um, couldn't even learn simple functions and so there was a crisis in funding of AI and the first AI winter arrived and then the next boom of AI was these no export systems. Um, there uh, people found out after a while that the rule basis grew to very complex and became very brittle and very hard to maintain and there was a knowledge bottleneck to try to get the knowledge from domain experts into the machine, didn't scale. Uh, usually the domain expert didn't have time to teach the machine and probably they were worried about losing their job. So <laughs> uh, second AI winter and now obviously more recently with machine learning, I would say since the 90s that problem has been solved because now the, the machines can learn from massive amounts of data also helped by the big data and, and data is everywhere and becomes easier accessible and obviously also progress in algorithms like much better neural nets, deep, deeper deep learning, decision trees, random forests and all that. And so there is this explosive growth now of AI in the form of a subfield called machine learning. Supervised learning is probably the most successful of that. And now people start to wonder whether, you know, this bias in, bias out problem could lead to a backlash against AI. Uh, people could think, oh, untrusted black boxes are making decisions about my life that affect me in a bad way. And, and we see headlines every other week, some AI, AI algorithm went haywire and would bias against minorities or protected groups and, and all that. Um, Another assumption about the future could be that there is a lot of hype, but eventually that will normalize and the AI will do its job. And then the third one, the optimistic one, is that AI will deliver benefits at scale. So uh, I think we're all in that group. We want AI to deliver benefits at scale without harming people. And so the uh, FICO credit scoring view on that is that um, Whenever we develop a predictive model, such as a credit score, we have to balance several objectives. And in AI, narrow AI, machine learning is only focused on one of those, namely the best fit. So machine learning gives us the best fit to the data. That's pretty much it. And these other dimensions, credibility, trust, fairness, uh, compliance, robustness, all that uh, needs to be 
still uh, done by domain experts. So we have this interplay between domain expertise and machine learning, and the trick is to combine that through an effective interface. So this interface, um, human-machine interface, is bidirectional. So on the one hand, the domain expert need to be able to learn easily from data, because the data tell us something about human behavior. And on the other hand, the machine also needs to be constrained in certain ways by the domain expert to be compliant with the law and so on. And, and so when I think of AI, the, the acronym I, I rather like to think of augmented intelligence, where you combine human expertise with machine learning to get the best of both worlds. And uh, so in terms of benefits at scale, I think the credit scoring is a great success story since the 50s, um, we, yesterday we heard a great talk about this rampant discrimination, redlining that happened. Um, you, um, loan officers sometimes made racist decisions and then credit scoring eliminated the judgment by just focusing on who is a good and bad payer. At the same time, it was regulated with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act to protect vulnerable groups and uh, resulting in the FICO score 30 years ago that works for uh, very diverse populations. However, there's 190 million people in the US that have a FICO score, but then there's 25 million underbanked. So one could see there is still a, uh, at least a, a few years ago, there was still a kind of lack of opportunity for the underbanked. So FICO has innovated in that space with the Ultra FICO and FICO XD which are scores that use alternative data, consumer contributed data, bill payment data to also assign credit scores to the, to the underbanked. But the work is not done, so I think in the next few years we, we need to keep the innovations going to reduce bias and, and boost fairness even more. Um, so my, just a practical experience from, uh, uh, we're using AI for a long time, um, basically it, it's not going to lead to killer improvements, but it makes the model development much more effective. So what took people six weeks can now be done in six days or one day. And uh, the second one, as I said, augmented intelligence, I believe trumps narrow artificial intelligence and machine learning. And also, I think it's still true, good data, representative, reliable, and relevant, still trumps the latest and greatest algorithmic techniques. Great, thank you very much, Gerald. We're now gonna move along to Ashley, who has a unique perspective on some of the misunderstandings of AI in the business world, and specifically why companies have yet to derive much value uh, from the technology. Yeah, so when I think about AI in general, something that's really interesting to me is this news trend that we're seeing a lot around how companies just don't feel like they're getting the strategic value they were promised. One reason for that is obviously just the misconceptions we've already talked about that people were thinking robots taking our jobs, people were thinking you know, big consumer applications that run in the cloud that aren't really as applicable to most of our enterprise context. But I think another more important reason for this group is really about how AI has been rolled out as a technology and the ongoing process that we're actually still in the middle of to use this in a strategic way. There's three pieces to this. One are the tools and technologies. That's the easiest one to understand. We have to make sure our data is all in a place we can learn on it. We have to make sure we have the right algorithms, the right platforms. That part is fairly reasonable, but that doesn't make a strategic capability. That doesn't actually change the way organizations make decisions or impact the organization really almost in any way other than data storage, which is what I think a lot of people ended up with when they implemented a lot of these technologies originally. The second, obviously, most important thing is a business use case. It's great to have this aspiration of having AI really be strategically valuable to your company, but this is kind of a crawl, walk, run situation. You can't just go straight from like, we're not using this technology at all, to all of a sudden, it's a strategic capability underpinning all of our decision making in our organization. That's just not realistic. So the path you can walk down is related to business use cases and you know CLOs, ABS, that's a really interesting one where you can say, okay, here's a specific problem, this is how we're gonna solve it with AI and we're gonna build it on top of a technology stack that will allow us to scale. 
so that we can in the future add additional use cases and additional use cases until over time it actually really does become the strategic capability that we all want it to be. The third one, which I think is really not talked about very much, is workflow and processes. So historically, the way people tend to implement AI today and machine learning is they take whatever analog human system they already had and they pull some people out and they stick some machine learning in. And they think, oh, great. That's not really going to get you the strategic value that you want because you haven't actually changed the way you're thinking about the problem at all. So the analogy I usually like to use is related actually to the Industrial Revolution and the transition from steam factories to electric factories. So steam factories, you know, the way they were built was you had this gigantic boiler because you had to boil a lot of water. And then you would take all that steam, the energy from the steam, and shunt it down to all of the individual machines with big belts that ran down from the ceiling. You can Google this, it's really not great looking. The thing that is fascinating to me about that is electricity, you know, the way we deal with electricity now was invented in like the mid 19th century. And it took us about 70 years to actually stop building factories that way. Like even though we didn't have to build them that way, people up until after World War I still built big electric generating things with belts going down to all the machines. And I think we're in a similar moment with AI right now where we just haven't really figured out how we want to use the technology from first principles. What are the ways we can actually understand its benefits, understand the value that it has, and actually design new workflows around that technology as opposed to trying to shove a technology into a hole from an outdated set of processes. So I think you know, once, we start to, once we finish this transition where we have tools and technologies, business use cases, and new processes, evolving that over time, that's where we end up getting the strategic capability that people are, really want. Thank you, Ashley. It's an excellent segue, actually, into the second part of this panel, which is where we want to provide a little bit of color and detail on some real-world applications of AI and how it's being utilized specifically. And for that, I'm going to first call on Mike uh, to, uh, to go through some of the uh, predictive analytics, machine learning, and NLP that uh, Chara is doing. Uh, but yes, um, one, basically I'm a technologist and still a developer after 30 years, so I'm very keen on understanding how things work and what's possible. Um, I'm, I was actually, when thinking back, the, I started my first uh, career in the first AI wave of applying expert systems to chip design at Hewitt Packard. So, and afterwards I got into finance, and it's been uh, different since. Um, one, certainly in structured finance, one big application is predictive analytics. You have thousands of collateral items and you're trying to forecast uh, what the behavior of prepaid default and severity is for each of these uh, thousands of lo loans. And this is something, though, that has people have been doing for decades using other uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, logistical regressions, support vector machines, these are things that people have been using for decades. So we've been doing, in some sense, machine learning for, for a long time. The, the latest uh, buzz, though, is the application of deep learning into giving some additional insight, perhaps, and al allowing of better and faster model development uh, into for, uh, predictive analytics. The bulk of, uh, of this seems, has been focused on the mortgage data space, but uh, because I think the, the data sets are available and, and it allows and the, the, the correlations of all the variables is, is very large, but other asset classes such as corporate loans, um, uh, commercial backed loans, which are you know, much more granular, uh, also could be um, uh, similar techniques could be applied. Uh, the, the whole process of underwriting, of course, uh, th that feeds into the, the, the um, collection of these assets is, is another area. Um, one big area is that I've been recently looking into is the, uh, um, natural language understanding of documents. Uh, structured finance, there's tons of documents being produced. Some of it's very clean, but a lot of it's not. And uh, so therefore, um, for traders and people trying to understand, uh, you know, they're looking at a bid list and they want to look at a set of deals and, and go, they're paging through PDF files to understand the reinvestment conditions of CLO. That's something that uh, natural language understanding can help summarize for them. and 
and improve that process. Uh, outlier analysis is another um, uh, problem. It's like we do have thousands of, typically many firms are trying to mark their book and, and they're getting thousands of prices from different sources and, or from their analytic systems and then they want to identify exactly things that need closer examination. Um, out of, they're trying to, you may have by s some measure of uh, rules that may generate 5,000 exceptions and then, but that just, it's just too much to handle. And so with uh, uh, application of AI to narrow down to perhaps 50 or 100 that could then be handled by a small team of people. Um, transaction processing, like again, a, in a bid list you're looking at, uh, they, they want to bid, they want a response in, in four hours and you're trying to look through all, all the facets of understanding of how to price something. Uh, it requires a lot of data and to pull all that together in a neat way and a dashboard for a trader to look at is also um, another way to, to to apply AI. And finally, uh, also the um, uh, potential for new uh, user interfaces uh, for both visualization and pro producing analytics. Um, right now, um, you know, to produce a row rate matrix, that's something that either you have pre-designed pre screens for or, but uh, to allow uh, someone to even uh, speak it and also have the system understand uh, the parameters and the filters so that you don't have to write, you know, deal with SQL or query languages of any kind would be another uh, uh, area that we're looking into. Um, finally, there's this whole area of risk management. Uh, there are problems that you know, look promising to, 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 to apply AI to. Uh, we have this transition to, from LIBOR that's going on, so identifying you know, all the trades and securities that, you, you, that can be exposed to this uh, problem. Liquidity risk, counterparty risk, these are other uh, things that require a lot of data input. And, and some, uh, ideally, some uh, human expertise to evaluate and, and put limits on transactions. Um, also, uh, it's, it's actually CECL, uh, the current ex, uh, expected uh, current loss uh, legislation for banks to understand uh, pro future projections of banks, of, of loans that they have, uh, is another. And also, most recently, um, looking at pricing, you know, take, looking at uh, in the, over the 30 years, I've had to and just pick up stochastic calculus and, and, and understand what's happening with uh, hedge ratios and, and ETO processes. But now um, there's even some rethink of looking at option hedging, uh, applying machine learning into that. Uh, JP Morgan recently uh, had a set of papers uh, talking about that. So, okay. Thanks, Michael. Sure. And now uh, we'd like to ask uh, Damien to comment a little bit in terms of his uh, contextual application of AI as it comes as a, as a, in the context of real estate and home pricing, something that you're working on. And if I can just ask the AV people, perfect. That's great. Um, I have a question for the audience. How many people are using AI in their business today? Show your hands. A little bit less than 10%. How many people are considering using AI in their business? Not now, but at some point, either current, either in the near term or the long term. Okay. And I guess the rest are on the fence, a little bit neutral. Okay. Well, you know, for those of us who lived through the uh, credit crisis as credit modelers, um, the challenge wasn't just around the impact to markets, to consumers, indeed to societies, um, but also the impact to models, right? To, um, the, the, to the impact in terms of a model or a mathematical representation of a behavior, whether that behavior be a consumer behavior, a market behavior, or, or even just a counterparty behavior. There were some big challenges at that time. And anybody who reads, um, you know, Manuel German's book, Models Behaving Badly, will get some pretty rich insights in that. Whether that was, you know, a traditional credit model based on the district regression, whether that was a CDO valuation type model based on the Coppola, um, there were some big problems. Um, in many ways, what was rooted in, in the model frameworks and architecture at the time was this classical statistical assumption of what we call the independence of observations, right? So that if you think of a credit model in mortgage, that all these borrowers are completely independent of each other. They don't know each other, they don't interact with each other, and whether you're building a linear or nonlinear model, that is a core assumption, and you don't represent anything other than that in your input data. 
Uh, but we know from the experience of the crisis uh, and indeed from, from many other events subsequently that contagion and percolation, uh, also uh, topical words at the moment for the wrong reason, uh, are a big part of the modeling of any type of behavioral representation, right? Things influence each other, right? And our models are not adequate captures of reality unless they represent that explicitly. Right? And, and that's really the backdrop to um, our adoption of what we call applied category theory in our work. Applied category theory is, uh, in many ways, I'd call it a cousin rather than a, a sibling of AI. Um, its roots are in pure mathematics, in particular set theory, and the cognate branch of that uh, being a category theory. Um, you see some of the uh, domain applications there most, most recently in deep learning for feature extraction, pattern recognition. <laughs> and fundamentally, it's rooted in the idea of similarity being represented by inclusion and exclusion. Okay? So how are things similar to each other? How are they different from each other? And that the most adequate representation of that is true membership or non-membership in a mathematical object <coughs> called a category theory. Um, the second uh, driver within the space, is, uh, which is, you, you know, I think pretty fundamental to applied math, is that we have some very, very typical problems to, to, to solve in our, in our, in our business, um, no matter what type of structured finance asset class we're looking at. But if we can port or migrate that problem statement or problem class to another area where we have more uh, robust tools or more effective tools, then that makes it easier to solve. So again, part of the, of the drive within category theory is to look at what we call similarity spaces where we can port very complex interactive behavioral type problems into a more resolute and a more uh, streamlined set of analytics. Um, the area that we focused on specifically in our business at Molebdenum is in the area of home price modeling. And we see real estate as being, you know, a major problem to for statistical models, firstly because of the uh, extreme nonlinearity, but also we really believe the, the real challenge there is not so much what a home price is or where it's going or what the forecast is, either for that individual property or that neighborhood or zip code, or whatever the ge geographic entity, um, but how do these areas and properties influence and emulate each other, right? So when an appraiser goes to um, value a property, <coughs> what they're fundamentally searching for is comps, right? What are the similar type properties that are gonna be um, similar to the subject property that, the, that using the pricing information of those properties <coughs> and the local real estate uh, market, they can then arrive at a valuation on that specific property, whether it's single family, multifamily, or whatever that is. And then when you roll that up to the aggregate level to a home price index, again, we have a similar, a similar type of challenge. Why is it that particular properties, if we think back to the last crisis, where we saw some early movement in, for example, in Bakersfield in Southern California as being, think of that as being a very early signal of turns in the market. So what we're really looking at here is using ACT to detect these early changes in particular geographic areas in these home price uh, indices and then true relationships with other geographic areas, then inferring what that means for some wider spaces. And um, our first set of work in that space has been very, oops, has been centered on non-QM. And for anybody who's invested in, in the class or analyzing the class, we know that there's some significant geoconcentration uh, within this paper. Um, this is uh, the latest data pushed up by, uh, put up by the FHFA just yesterday. Uh, and what we're looking at there is the uh, uh, CBSAs in the country that have particular high concentrations of non-QM loans. Um, what our ACT analytics enables us to do is to draw relationships between those um, GUs, and we've also done this at the, uh, at the, at the county level at the, and at the zip level as well. I'm very happy to share those results. Please see me afterwards or um, connect with me, and I'll be happy to share that with you. <coughs> Just see that where we have some changes in Oakland, what does that mean for the New York market, right? So the whole idea here is to draw similarity um, lessons here, even though these geographies are dispersed geographically in terms of linear distance in miles, right, but are actually very similar in terms of their real estate dynamics. Um, so we see some major applications for this um, in any form of trended data set, uh, whether for any time of uh, pricing trended data set, credit trends, behavioral trends, market trends, and uh, happy to share these results with uh, 
anybody wishes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Damien. So we're gonna go back to Ashley now to uh, explore a little bit about uh, what's going on in her world in terms of natural language processing. If we can switch back oh. to the previous presentation. I think one slide ahead, if somebody has, yeah, perfect. Great, so <laughs> moving on to natural language processing. So an example that I thought might be interesting for this group is how we're using our, the Eigen platform to scale CLO investment decision making. And this is really a natural language processing in general topic, not specifically related to our platform necessarily. So today, the problem. It's making decisions about CLOs is very time consuming, obviously. The documents are long, often more than 400 pages. You can't just skim them. They're very complicated. You need to get you know, the right information out of them. And then obviously, each investor has their own hypothesis investment thesis that they're working through and they need specific pieces of information that might be different from what another person trader needs. So it's not a one size fits all problem at all. You can't just have like a box piece of software that's gonna help you solve this. And also going back through the back book to look through trends, that's really hard with the technology, you know, when you've done this manually, you have to actually physically go back through all those documents. So enter natural language processing. So irrespective of our platform, this I think is a really good use case for how people start using AI inside an enterprise because it has the things we talked about earlier. It's a very clear business problem, very clear users, what you need to do, you know, the inputs and outputs are very straightforward. It's based on documents, so decision making within an enterprise starts right now with data that is usually trapped in documents. So starting to work through how you process your documents in an automatic way is really a helpful first step towards how you do this long term at scale to get that strategic benefit <coughs> that we all want for our companies. And then finally, the way you can operationalize this, it's pretty straightforward from a workflow perspective because right now it's usually one or two people who have a spreadsheet. So there's not a huge workflow <laughs> that, that needs to be disrupted within the company. So in terms of how our specific platform does this, basically what we have is a tool that allows you to ask questions and interrogate your documents. So if you want to understand, for example, what, under what circumstances can the manager of this CLO change, you can ask those questions, go through with our user interface and just highlight the answers. We're set up so that you don't need as much training data as you would normally need for a, a piece of software like this. So usually somewhere between 10 and 50 examples is, is enough to get a good result. And then you just go and you can actually kind of code in your own investment thesis by choosing what questions you actually want to ask and highlighting those answers. So we've had a customer, for example, be able to go and review 800 CLOs within weeks as opposed to you know, the two to three hours per document that it would take to do that manually over time. It helps um, our customers really codify in their investment thesis to make sure they're actually getting the right data out of every single CLO they look at at scale and they're not missing anything. And it's also better from a, a risk and price assessment perspective so they can make sure that they really are capturing what they need. And finally, being able to get trends, investment trends out of their documents is a really um, big benefit for our customers. So I think this is an interesting type of use case if you're thinking about using AI. Great, thanks, Ashley. So David, you had spoken earlier and gave some practical examples of at, at Vervent how you're actually incorporating some of these technologies into your business. I think that a lot of people in this audience, and certainly people who run uh, servicing administrations or, or other types of enterprises where they're processing um, large volumes of contracts and other types of inbound uh, type of inquiries into call centers, as you were mentioning, are probably wondering, in a typical corporate environment, how exactly, what was the path perhaps that you can, uh, that you took at Vervent in order to um, come up with a strategy and to implement these technologies? Well, I'll drill down to a specific example and I'll stay with documents since we're on documents at the moment. Uh, first off, we very much live in a steam-powered factory that recently discovered electricity. So <laughs> what we're doing in our context is really replacing those activities. I still have the, the big belt driving down to the factory floor. Um, but as an example, we have a client, um, longtime client, storefront lender. Storefront lender has about 1,000 stores, and these stores are spread all over the United States and Canada, um, some in Europe as well. And essentially, uh, they have a legacy software platform, which is more or less resisted all attempts at modernization. 
So they're really kind of like stuck there. What happens inside the store is that someone walks in, they want a loan, the employee will kind of get a pad of you know, paper that's pre-printed and they will start going like this and they'll fill it all out. At some point, they'll push that across the counter to the person who walked into the store who will sign it and then the employee takes it, rips it off the pad and files it into a filing cabinet. So now your collateral is spread across a thousand stores across the United States, <laughs> Europe and Canada. Not exactly ideal. Um, this company obviously wanted to tap into that collateral to free up some capital. Not surprisingly, they wanted to free up some capital and modernize their system. Um, but the question is, how do you do that? It's extremely difficult. Uh, and the solution that we came up with was that we had them take all of these pieces of paper out of the filing cabinet, and every day, on an ongoing basis, they take it and they put it on a scanner. They scan it all to a central repository up in the cloud. They all more or less look like this piece of paper that I've just scrabbled all over on. They have Sharpie marks, they have highlights. I mean, it's just nasty, right? There's things coming in which you know might be uh, random things that people do with scanners that aren't necessarily connected to any business purpose. It's just you know the kind of grab bag. So how do you make sense of these you know tens of thousands of documents, poor quality documents coming in? How do we turn that into something? And what we did was we turned it into a 400 million warehouse line with one of the large credit funds. And the way we did that was by building our document AI, where this is probably the third time we had done this, but we had gave it a chance to learn what these documents look like. And it obviously differed from you know, state to state, from country to country, all these types of things, but got it to learn to the point in a self-learning way that it could say what this document said with a 99.9% .9 accuracy. You know, sometimes it just can't tell you, but at the same time, it can also grade the probability that the document says what it thinks it says. Now we're able to combine that into a borrowing base and put the entire thing on a 12-hour cycle. So for this company with 1,000 stores, we are using the AI to produce a borrowing base every 12 hours. And they're able to get an advance rate of 80% on that piece of collateral, whereas previously they had an advance rate of 0% because they just could not you know, free up that collateral in order to do that. And it's the AI at the heart of it which reads these documents and puts them in the some kind of sense, much like my colleague was talking about with the CLOs. Now you can actually look at it, trend it, do all these things, and kind of that's, that's the path we took. We have generally always taken the path of solving specific problems and not taking the path of kind of, you know, an overall AI strategy. Thank you, David. And lastly, in this segment, I, by the way, I knew when we were planning this, we had run out of time. And just conscious of time, we just wanted to give Gerald a few more minutes in terms of their, the unique and novel approaches that are happening at FICO in terms of uh, using machine language and credit scoring and adjudication. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so initially, I wanted to talk about uh, some details how we apply machine learning for FICO score development, but I thought the discussion <clears throat> went into an interesting direction in terms of you know how can we gain strategic uh, advantages from AI rather than just uh, kind of efficiency improvements, right? And so what comes to mind is uh, a, <clears throat> a problem we, we help lenders to solve is to make better decisions. And the kind of limiting thing with machine learning is that it's very much focused on making better predictions. Mm -hmm. So I think to get into the strategic advantage, you have to take the leap, uh, kind of go beyond machine learning um, to make better decisions. And uh, to do that, you have to understand, uh, you know, the various objectives of the lenders, right? So lenders want to increase volumes, uh, grow their portfolios, they want to have low losses, they want to have high profit, and they want to, they watch the, uh, regulatory capital. So all these um, objectives are in trade-off relationships. And, and so one thing we're doing, and also to the point uh, Damien mentioned, right, there's not just one model in isolation, but there could be dozens or hundreds of models that predict different things. We, we combine these models into what, uh, what's called a decision model. Um, that helps lenders to make better decisions and kind of map out the trade-offs between these various business objective functions. So 
in, in that sense, AI doesn't tell us what's the optimal solution, but AI helps the lender to understand the trade-offs, and then a lender can decide where they want to operate on that efficient frontier. So that's kind of an, an, uh, an older concept from operations research, but that combines very well with machine learning to get from the predictions to, to the uh, strategically superior decisions. So one lender might decide, hey, I'm currently not at optimal, at, at the efficient frontier, so I see from the data I could either, uh, you know, keep the volume the same and decrease my losses. Or another option for a lender may be to increase the volume um, while, while controlling for the losses or to reduce the losses while keeping the volume the same. And, and so they can kind of decide where they want to operate based on their business utility function. But I think just the, the you know, the uh, power to use machine learning and decision modeling to map out those trade-offs is something our clients really appreciate much more than, you know, having a black box ma making this one optimal decision, right, and, and they don't have a say. So I think, again, comes back to the theme I said at the beginning, um, that our clients want to be in the driver's seat and not have a machine in the driver's seat, but, but the machine helps them to understand where they can gain strategic advantages. Thanks, Gerald. We have just a few minutes remaining. I thought uh, in the few minutes that we have left, if there's any questions that anybody in the audience has, please feel free. Otherwise, um, I'll proceed to ask for some predictions of where people think things are going in the next couple of years. Are there any questions from the audience? like to feel that. From my perspective, I've worked at a few different companies that have focused on machine learning for the enterprise, and we've actually tended to use simpler models, but layered in a way that can get more powerful results, kind of like what you were talking about, because of the explainability issue. It's very, very important to be able to go through model governance councils and get people to understand why these predictions are coming out. So I think more transparency, to me, is important in the enterprise context right now. I believe there's one other question. Yeah, it's actually very similar following up here. Um, from like origination or credit decision perspective, uh, maybe for Gerald, like how is explainability and how the regulation around explainability gonna change? So it depends on the market, the country. So wherever we build models, which is worldwide, so we build FICO scores in like 30 plus countries now, uh, we, we make sure we're you know, compliant with the local regulation. Um, I would also add that um, you know, sometimes a lot is made on of, you know, the trade-off between predictive abilities and explanatory abilities, and if you want to explain, you lose a lot of prediction, and that's often not true. So it's often possible to get in a sweet spot where you give up just a tiny little bit in terms of predictive power, but you're going to make your model much more explainable. So that's where we like to operate, and for, from a technical perspective, a lot of research is going on in explainable AI, explainable machine learning, XAI, XML. Um, but a lot of that is kind of first you train the black box and then you try to explain it. And we have a technology that's more uh, proactive that uh, where we, during uh, training the model, we can already put in constraints so that we get the best fit to the data subject to explainability constraints. Which, which, which is more powerful than having to explain a black box after the fact. Excellent, thank you. Well, that's about all the time we have this morning. I just wanted to quickly thank our expert panel for providing us with their views and their expertise on this important and exciting uh, technology that's going to affect all of our lives, if it doesn't already, in the uh, coming few years. So thank you again for attending, and safe travels home. Thank you.